My name is Michael Droge. Um, thanks everybody for coming out today. I'm really excited to have you here and um, thank you to the Maine Jewish Museum for hosting us today and for hosting this exhibition and being such generous hosts. Um, so we are at the Maine Jewish Museum in Port, it's located in Portland, Maine, which was the which was settled on traditional territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Um, thank you um, to Stephen Profazer, who's right here in the audience. I don't know if I said your name right, I hope so. Um, that he's a, Stephen is the Chief Communications Officer at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. And he connected me with Dr. Beth Orcutt. And thank you, Beth. Um, Beth is a senior research scientist, a senior research scientist at Bigelow Laboratories um, and collaborated with me. So thank you for your collaboration and your time and for your ongoing research and for the work that you do for um, our ocean ecosystems and environments. Um, Beth is a marine microbial microbiochemist Bio, Biogeochemist, sorry, <laughs> who, explore, <laughs> who explores life below the seafloor in the sediments and in the ocean crust. Her research looks at how microbes thrive in these deep sea environments, how their life act the cycling elements of the earth and how they can be impacted by emerging deep sea industries. So without further ado, here's Beth. Thank you, Michael. All right, and I'm going to... Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to take my mask off for this talk. I just recently had a COVID test, so I feel comfortable doing that. Um, so, you know. All right. So thank you all for coming today to uh, this presentation to hear about this art plus science collaboration. Um, and uh, kind of my interpretation of this collaboration and the art, which is a bit intimidating for me as a scientist to talk about art, but um, I'm excited to do it nonetheless. And, okay, there we go. Uh, like Michael, I wanna start with some gratitude and acknowledgements of how this came to be and why I'm here in front of you today. Um, and I like to start with this image of Earth, planet Earth, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's only 30% of the surface is land. It's mostly ocean. <laughs> and that's the part that I'm excited about. And I want to thank the caretakers of this land, both where I'm working, uh, ancestral and modern. As Michael mentioned, this space is the traditional homeland of the Wabanaki Confederacy. But my work takes me all around the world. And so I'm thankful to those um, communities that welcome me there as well. Um, I want to thank all of my colleagues who have enabled this research that I'm going to talk to you about today and that I'm uh, really passionate about working with. Um, none of the work I talk about would be possible without the amazing crew of the ships and the vessels that we use to do this deep sea exploration. Um, and I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now if we hadn't started this collaboration with Michael. So thank you for this journey that I've been able to go on with you um, and to the Maine Jewish Museum for allowing this to happen and the funders for the science that I'll be mentioning to you today. So start with the inspiration part, right? We often look towards the ocean as a source of inspiration. So a, a show of hands for those of you in the audience, and you can raise your hands on Zoom if you want. Um, how many of you have been snorkeling in the ocean? Okay, a lot of hands going up. How many of you have been scuba diving? Okay, so a little bit fewer hands, right? You've maybe gone a little bit deeper into the ocean. How many of you have been in a submarine? All right, a couple of people, Ooh, right? But it's a very small fraction. And it's partially because some of these folks are from Bigelow <laughs> and work with me. Uh, typically there would be no hands up in the audience, right? So our exposure to the ocean environment is very limited from our view of seeing it from the surface. Um, but for me, this is important to think about because we know more about the surface of other planets then we know about our own surface of Earth when you think about hard surface, right? And that's because you can't see through the water down to the bottom. So there's a lot down there that we don't know. Only 20% of our seafloor has been mapped at high resolution. 
You may have heard the news story the other day about one of the US submarines crashing into something in the South China Sea because they didn't know it was there. Um, so <laughs> uh, there's a lot down there that we don't know about. And so I like this cartoon from XKCD, which I put this blue box on it, um, right? With this very skewed viewpoint of the ocean, still stranded with nothing but the flat empty water as far as the eye can see. But really there's so much more down there. <laughs> and this is obviously a conceptual view of the, the sea beasts <laughs> and other things. But this is the end part of the earth that I'm fascinated with. And if you were to remove that water, you can imagine that on the bottom of the ocean, there are underwater volcanoes, underwater mountains, underwater lakes, where there's lots of salt that keeps the water from mixing. There's deep sea trenches. Um, but again, we don't have a lot of this in high resolution. So you might know that maybe there's a hill down there, but you don't know how tall it is. You don't know how wide it is. <clears throat> um, and so I am very fortunate that I've had a chance to go to the bottom of the ocean when I was a student um, working as a research technician, uh, research uh, student, and it changed my life. It was like going to another planet. Or I imagine that's what it would feel like. <laughs> um, and there, every dive that we go on, every time we lower a robot to the bottom of the ocean, we're seeing new animals for the first time. Um, uh, and that's not an overstatement. <laughs> every single we were discovered and go down. And so that um, to me represents a, a huge landscape for exploration, for understanding how does life exist on our planet if we don't even know that they're down. Um, and so what I want to do right now is show you a short video that was put together by some of my colleagues at the Schmidt Ocean Institute, because they do a much better job of showing you the deep ocean than I can, because they have amazing imagery from the deep sea. Can you all hear that okay in the room? What you are looking at isn't some alien world. This is here on planet Earth. Extending beyond depths of 3,000 meters, the deep sea makes up half the ocean. Though it is a place we hardly know and almost never see, it is in fact the largest habitable space for life on Earth. Okay. And yet, with just over 20% of the sea coral mapped in any detail, only a tiny fraction of this incredible environment has been explored and studied. These animals and landscapes seem like the stuff of dreams. But in reality, these intricate and delicate systems play a vital role in sustaining life on Earth. And we are only just beginning to learn how vulnerable they are to climate change. We humans have had an incredible impact on the space, despite not being here, despite not doing great job of exploring it. The effects of a changing climate have already altered the deep sea and will continue to do so. Temperatures are estimated to rise by one degree Celsius in the deep ocean by 2100. It is almost certain to have harmful effects on organisms so finely tuned to survive in such environments. There are still countless undiscovered species dwelling in the abyss. Many of these organisms are so new to science that we are only just beginning to understand them, while others remain completely unknown. Every time we go down into the deep ocean, we discover something new. There's something we haven't seen. There's a new species, a totally new type of habitat. There's nothing like that feeling and that excitement of 
looking at something that you know is new, trying to figure out how this new piece of our planet works. Compared to conducting research on that, the challenges for exploring the deep sea are immense. Exploration of this world has only just begun thanks to advancements in technology in recent decades. The single greatest impediment to studying the deep ocean is that it's not as transparent as air. I can look up with my own eyes and see the surface of the moon a quarter of a million miles away, but I can't even see half a mile into the ocean. That's why we have to develop technologies that can act as our eyes and ears. Ocean science is working with engineers and innovators to overcome the challenges of deep sea exploration and to prove that understanding this ecosystem is not only possible, but essential. We're developing exciting new technologies for oceanographic exploration, which feed us valuable information on the current state of our oceans. It's been more than a decade of development to get these pieces of equipment to the point that they're at where you can go out and do an experiment like this. And it's sort of long-term investment that I think is going to transform how we do ocean science. One of the most and the question is always, how do we find it? From remotely operated and autonomous technology to listening devices and imaging systems, a staggering array of innovative equipment is now at our disposal. Shining the light into the deep for the first time. And the wondrous things we've illuminated have captured the world's attention. Every single time an ROV dive takes place, we see something amazing. We see something we weren't expecting to see. We see life in environments where we don't expect to see life. The ocean is full of surprises, and our exploration is so in its infancy. As these submerged visions appear, we realize that for every natural wonder on dry land, there's countless more underwater waiting to be discovered. I always find it amazing to think that no human eyes have actually looked at this piece of sea core before. Most of us recognize the Amazon rainforest. Yet, in the depths of our oceans stand ancient coral forests, teeming with life and far less explored. Just like we all know, we cut down the rainforest, a lot of important functions are lost that those rainforests provide, including potentially in the United States. And so the same kind of concepts apply here to the bottom of the ocean. I've said this a few times today. It's not every day you find a 500 meter tall reef in the Great Barrier Reef. New coral reefs are still being discovered thanks to the high resolution maps we do have. But how many more are still hidden from us? Contrasting with these ancient coral ecosystems are bubbling superheated vent systems that support organisms right out of science fiction. Imaginably so dark, toxic, and hot that the very idea of life proliferating there would seem absurd. Crazy hydrothermal rock, full of noxious chemicals, you know, arsenic and selenium, and it's potentially radioactive, and yet it is teeming with life. And that's just astonishing to me. And you think about what you can learn from studying something like that. So it's a tremendous opportunity. From crushing pressures to pitch black darkness, from inhospitable cold to superheated systems, deep sea organisms are masterfully evolved to survive in places we originally thought life could not possibly exist. There's all kinds of challenges living in an environment like this, yet life proliferates. Until very recently, 
these alien worlds remained isolated from human impact. However, as we further our understanding of the deep, we are beginning to see just how vulnerable these environments are to the changes people are making to the planet. It's devastating to see that impact on these ecosystems before we even fully understand them. Everything on Earth is part of an interconnected system. Sea, air, land, and ice are linked by important life-sustaining processes. Understanding what those processes are is really important to how we understand how the climate of our planet works. As we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and our planet heats up, these processes shift and change. As the ocean warms, the conditions and patterns which sustain life are altered, and we may lose environments and species without knowing they ever existed. We're the ones who are capable of having the greatest impact for good or for bad. You wouldn't go and build a house on land that you haven't surveyed. That you don't know what's under there. You wouldn't drink water that you haven't tested to see if it's clean or if it's poisonous. Studying the ocean in the way we're doing and many others do allows us to help us understand what our ocean is about, what it takes to keep it healthy, and how can we reap the greatest benefit from it through sustainable practices? How do we do the best job that we can of being the caretakers of our world? The first COVID drugs to clinical trials using deep sea compounds to treat lung cancer and Alzheimer's. There is an abundance of information in the ocean's depths that could be vital to our survival, and the deep may also hold solutions for mitigating the effects of climate change. The importance of understanding these environments is paramount. By coming up with new ways to explore this largest inhabitable volume on the planet, we're essentially establishing a baseline, biologically speaking, what's there, and then from there, understand the changes we're making to it. The future is hopeful, but there is still much more to discover, and so much that we still need to learn. Some deep sea organisms are 4,000 years old, having started life when human beings were only just inventing how to write. Their environments have remained relatively stable for millennia. And now we are accelerating change at an unprecedented rate. We must dive deep and look into these worlds beyond imagining to discover what is there before they are lost forever. People from all around the world are working together to create the tools and methods to better uncover what lies hidden in its most inaccessible depths of the ocean. We still have time to address the problem, to highlight and underscore ways to make things better, to change the way people think about it. Through this vital work, we hope to unlock a profound understanding of our planet, our ecosystems, and ourselves. More than ever before, the deep sea needs us. And from the moment when life on Earth began, we need it too. Yeah, so videos do a much better job than just me talking <laughs> about what the deep sea looks like. There we go. So from that background, where you kind of get a glimpse of what it's like to be a deep sea scientist and the struggles that are inherent in doing deep sea science, but also the just the inspiring organisms that are down there. Uh, I'll pivot now to talking about this collaboration a little bit, how I am seeing art as a way to um, raise awareness about the deep sea and the challenges that the deep sea faces, because it is a place that very, very, very few people will ever get to go to, and yet it is so important to us. Um, and so I'm excited about what um, art can bring to that conversation. Um, 
So <laughs> I'll start with this image. For those of you on Zoom who can't see the gallery we're in right now, Michael's paintings are all around us. Um, and Galim, I, I hope I'm saying that correctly, is behind us, um, named after one of the um, myriads, um, the nymphs <laughs> of the ocean. And I wanted to start with this one because for me, this painting really captures some of that whimsy and enthusiasm and excitement of the deep sea, the organisms that are down there. Even though it's an abstract conception of the deep sea from Michael uh, taking the collaboration that we had where I was showing videos and images just like what you saw and talking about my experience as a deep sea scientist and to see that then translated into something beautiful and inspiring with depth. Um, uh, to me, one of the first things I saw when I, uh, the, the white part of this painting and the, the marks in it reminded me of some of the amazing bioluminescent uh, squid that are in the deep ocean and their skin and how it's like a, a firework show when they're touched, when they're excited. Another part of how this uh, work of Michael's helps me explain the deep ocean is in some of the works like the euphotic, or the light zone, <laughs> and the aphotic, the, the zone without light. So euphotic is over there, aphotic is over here to the side of the screen, right? So light, even though it's the deep sea, the sun is not making it down there, there's still light in these environments. Again, because of bioluminescence, and animals communicate with one another with this bioluminescence. There's even thought that the hydrothermal vent fluid itself, because it's so hot, gives off radiative waves that can be interpreted as light from organisms that have the right sensors for it. Um, and so light is still an important part of the deep sea, even though it's so far removed from our experience up here in the surface. Here's a conceptual view of some of these deep sea environments that I study a lot and that I talk with Michael about in our conversations. So moving from left to right, you have some of these uh, hydrothermal vent systems these are places where two ocean plates are pulling apart and you have magmatic injection from below. And so you have underwater volcanoes, hydrothermal systems. As those sites move off axis, um, those vents become inactive, but the metals that were in that hot water that precipitated are still there. So you have metal rich environments as you move away from the, the ridge flank. You can also have underwater mountains, uh, called sea mounts that uh, used to be on the ridge axis, but have moved far away. But the, the tops of those mountains still exist. You can imagine in your mind the Hawaiian island chain, right? Those are sitting on top of old sea mounts. And as you go further and further away from the big island, they get shallower and shallower. Um, <clears throat> and then out into the abyssal plains, where it's not just mud, but you can also have environments with rocks on the seafloor. In all of these environments, of course, there are interesting animals, new species that have yet to be discovered on these places, but there are also life forms that you can't see with your own eyes, the microscopic organisms. That's what I study. I'm fascinated by these microbes and how they survive in these strange places, getting energy from chemical reactions instead of from sunlight and supporting these ecosystems. And so I, I wanted to show you this conception before I talk about some of the other paintings in this exhibit. So here are two paintings that capture my imagination here. One is Hemolithotroph's Backyard. You might be wondering, what does that word mean? <laughs> so that's a way to describe the lifestyle of some of the microbes that I study. They get energy from chemistry uh, coming from the rocks, litho, and that's kind of their trophic lifestyle, the way that they eat, is they get their energy from the environment. Um, and I like the way that this is conceptualized with thinking of the deep sea, organisms eating rocks. I can see that in this space, but I can also see the dynamic environment that these organisms are experiencing. It's not the same place all the time. Probably the, the most literal painting in the <laughs> uh, uh, whole exhibit is Holothurians. And if you don't know what Holothurian means, it is the scientific term for sea cucumbers, these little sea slug guys that 
are um, carnivores at the bottom of the ocean. They're scavengers, right? They, they sift through all the particles and get their energy that way. Um, they're very fun to watch. <laughs> um, but again, most of the paintings in this exhibit are not about literal interpretations of the deep sea. They're more about what the deep sea is inspiring. And so I want to focus our attention now to a different part, which is getting more towards that exploitation aspect of the talk title. And so I've circled here uh, activities that are happening out in the abyssal plain, where you have a device that seems like it's going along towards those rocks and it's supported by a vessel up at the top. Why? Rocks on the seafloor contain metals in relatively high concentrations. And so that is making them attractive as a potential source for critical metals that are needed to fuel our fossil um, fuel free future, right? So lithium ion batteries that are in e e electric vehicles that are in your computers and cell phones that are used to store the energy that's captured from wind energy and solar energy. Those all require metals to function. And so the price of metals has gone up quite a lot in the last few years. And so it's driving commercial interest to find new resources for metals. And so there's an interest in potentially trying to scoop up these rocks from the seafloor to get the metals that are in them, as opposed to continuing to mine for them on land. This is a conceptual rendering of what one of those machines might look like. When I was a student, this was really presented as kind of like this, there's interest in this, but it's science. The price of metals is never going to be strong enough. To this. But this isn't true anymore. Like there are actual prototype mining machines that have been demonstrated. This is a very quickly evolving um, uh, potential industry. So the idea here is that a, a device would go along the seafloor where there are metals to pull them up, which you obviously don't see in this image are any animals. <laughs> they would also be impacted by this kind of work. And so uh, the scientific community is trying to rally to figure out, okay, if this is going to happen, what might the potential impacts be? Can we do this sustainably? Um, and so work was done several decades ago, actually, to get started on this and do some initial kind of pilot tests of like, if we go through the seafloor and clear it out of the rocks, will the animals come back? Will the ecosystem reset? Um, before I get to that, I wanna to talk to you about where this activity might happen. So this is a map showing where potentially mineral rich um, resources might be on the seafloor. And there are three different kinds. Uh, depending on the environment type, but essentially places where there's a lot of metal might be in what are called nodules. Um, they're kind of like potato sized rocks out in the abyssal plains. Those are represented in blue. Um, the metals that precipitate from hydrothermal vent fluids are around hydrothermal vent systems, which ring the mid ocean ridges, highlighted with these orange dots. And then the seamounts that poke up above the seafloor also can have high metal content on the rinds that form on those rocks. Those are represented in yellow. You'll see that there's an area here uh, highlighted with a dashed line called the Clarion Clipperton Zone. This is the area that is getting the most interest right now from industry as a potential site to start mining. In your mind, compare the size of that space, that blue area, to the continental United States. There's interest in mining an area that is as large as the continental United States. So just to give you an idea of your, uh, yourself a sense of the potential impact that this could have. And if we zoom in on that area of the Clarion Clipperton zone, you can see that that whole space that is roughly the same size as the continental United States has already been carved up into several exploration contracts that are managed by the International Seabed Authority as part of the UN. So these are areas where different um, uh, contractors can be exploring the seafloor for the mineral content of the rocks. And then they uh, hope to uh, petition the International Seabed Authority to then start collecting rocks from a certain fraction of that space. Um, so this isn't sci-fi anymore. This is really happening. So again, as I was mentioning, colleagues uh, in this space are, are desperately trying to understand what these potential impacts are. And one of the things we know is that when you go to these environments that have these nodules, that the nodules are essential 
for the life in that place because the animals want to anchor themselves to a hard substrate as opposed to getting lost in the murky sediment next, next to it. So in new species of anemones, corals, um, sponges, brittle stars are all associated with these rocks. And so you can imagine if they remove, remove the rocks from these environments, the animals will not have anywhere to resettle. And I should point out that it takes probably 10,000, 100,000 years for these rocks to form. So they're not going to be replaced in a human lifetime. <laughs> um, so a study was done where they went through and trawled an area. They came back 35 years later. And if you compare what healthy, unperturbed seafloor with rocks looks like, and healthy seafloor that maybe doesn't have rocks, but it still has an indication of animals because you can see their trails in the sediment. If you compare that to an area that had previously been mock trawled, animals haven't recovered. The sediment doesn't look like animals are there, right? These systems will not reset on a human lifetime. Uh, so the impacts are, um, could be long, very long lasting. So then transitioning back to the um, Michael's art and thinking about how art can help me tell this story. I think about some of these other paintings and one way that I think about them, right? These images, Deep Sea Dreaming 1 and 2, are very dynamic for me. A lot of space, a lot of confusion, a lot of movement. And one way that I interpret that is these are systems that are changing. Um, you know, that these systems are stable on millennia. So this is a lot of energy <laughs> uh, in these paintings. And so I uh, view these as a way to kind of convey um, that urgency, that, that change, but also still capture the beauty and the wonder of the deep sea. I also think about these other two works, um, uh, Amphitrite's Balm and Heart of Dynamine, again, bringing in the, the uh, Greek mythology and the Nereids um, in this, again, representing to me kind of violent change in the ocean space. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out, I don't even know if Michael appreciates this, deep sea organisms are named after these same Nereids. So uh, this is a, a short video I can show you of uh, what are called amphipods. Uh, so their name, their name derives from uh, the Nereids, right? So these are, again, deep sea scavengers, right? So there's, without even knowing it, there was a connection between the art and the science in terms of the naming of these organisms and um, uh, these ocean myths. Two other pieces in this exhibit, Rendezvous and Subphotic Celebration, again, bringing back that light connection, the dynamic nature of the marks in these paintings, um, uh, conveying that change. Um, uh, for me, that's what I see in these. And then these two in particular, for me, capture the potential um, devastation <laughs> that deep sea mining could cause in these ecosystems, right? That you really are moving far away from the blues and the yellows of the other artwork here to, to something very different. And I appreciate that the one on the right is called the gift because it may feel like a gift to get all these rocks, but really is that the gift we want? Like if we're going to destroy the ecosystem at the same time. Okay, so I don't wanna bum you out that like moving towards fossil free future is not what we should be doing. That's not at all what I'm saying. I want a fossil free future. I want to stop burning fossil fuels. How do we ju ju juxtapose those two things? Well, the need is for the metals, right? And so we as consumers of these devices, of these cars, of this energy can demand uh, of the providers of these things that we want them to do it well, right? So if you were in the market for an electric vehicle, talk to those, um, uh, the people uh, 
providing those cars and talk to them about what are they doing for lithium ion battery recycling? Do they already have a program to help you um, uh, reuse the metals that might be in your car? Likewise, there's a lot of research going on right now to build metal-free batteries or batteries with better environmental impacts. And so the more that we can invest in that and encourage that kind of research and development, the less demand there will be for these metals so that there won't be a demand to go down to the deep sea and get them. But most importantly, the largest source of metals is in our landfills. So if we were better stewards of how we use our components and promoting better metal recycling of our waste streams, then again, we would lower the need for having these metals and wanting to get them from the deep sea. So if you have any electronics, please don't throw them in the trash. There are programs that will help you recycle those components. Um, here in Maine, it's called Call to, Re um, Call to Recycle. And you can find them at a lot of the hardware stores. They have little drop boxes. And I hope that by doing those things, we can take the inspiration of what to me was when I came into this gallery was the painting I hadn't yet seen before in the collaboration with Michael. I had seen many of the others already, but this one was new to me. And it's actually the one that's with the title here in the gallery, Thalia, which is, a, um, again, another Nereid, um, but one that encourages to be green, if you think about the translation of the, um, the name. And so this is such a great encapsulation of that for me because it shows me that there is hope <laughs> for where we could go, that we can still be green, but not have these same impacts that we um, might potentially have if we don't do this well. Uh, and so with that, I want to tell you about a company you can participate in that is related to this concept and the concept of exploring the deep sea. And that is that I'm going to be going out to sea soon to explore a part of the U.S. exclusive economic zone, which is highlighted in this map as the areas uh, circled in yellow. So these are places that are part of the US exclusive economic zone, like it means that other countries can't come in and do work there without asking us permission first. And the color in that yellow area is an indication of whether or not that seafloor has been mapped. Yellow indicates that it is deep water that has never been mapped before. Again, coming back to that idea that only 20% of our seafloor is known. If you were to add up all that area underwater, that the US claims, it's actually more than the continental United States on land, right? And you can tell how much of that pink coral color is here. There's so much that we have never explored, let alone mapped. Um, and I'm gonna be, uh, I have the great privilege of being invited to join an uh, expedition of the Ocean Exploration Trust vessel, the Nautilus which is leaving in a few days <laughs> to go explore some underwater mountains in the Northern Hawaiian island chain, um, uh, which is also within the Papahanaumoa Kuakea Marine National Monument. It is an area of cultural significance to native Hawaiian indigenous uh, communities. And it is a great honor to be able to go join this expedition where we're gonna be visiting these mountains for the first time ever to see what those underwater animals look like and I'll be collecting some samples to look at the microbiology. And you can follow along. They will be live streaming the coverage. You can see the deep sea at the same time we are by just going to that website, nautiluslive.org. And this expedition is funded by many different organizations, but the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration is a big one. And so to close, I'm really excited about what art can bring to science and how science can um, be told through art. I'm so thankful to Michael that we, and so thankful to Stephen for connecting us um, and allowing this new way to talk about the work that I do. If you don't already know about Michael's work, please go to their website. <laughs> um, and if you wanna connect with me more, you can find me on Twitter at the Micro. Uh, and finally, a plug for the place where I work, Bigelow Laboratory, which is up in East Booth Bay, Maine. Um, just about an hour up the road. And we do all kinds of amazing science there. And I'd be happy to talk with you about it if you'd like to know more. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah. We have a sense. Um, 
with within the material that's already in our landfills, is that if we recycled all of that, is how long could we last at the current rate of those? I've never seen anything like that calculated. Do you have any idea? That's a good question. So for folks on Zoom who couldn't hear the question, it was if we were able to recapture the metals that are in our landfills, like how long, how much longer would that give us? <laughs> um, I don't have a good answer for you for that question. Uh, partially because um, those calculations always are hinged on what is our current technology, right? What is our current usage? Um, and what excites me is that there's so much innovation happening to maybe reduce the need for some of those metals. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is the way that we as humanity design components that become part of the waste stream, we don't design them with the intention of taking them apart and reusing them. Uh, and so part of the reason we are not going into our landfills to get this metal is that it's every batch of garbage is bespoke and how would you like re-extract those metals? Um, and so that's why it's so hard to calculate the economics of it. Um, but the few um, articles I have seen in this topic suggest that there's enough metal in those spaces to fuel in our landfill spaces and our, our waste streams um, to be able to compensate for the metal needs that we predict going forward in the future, again, using current technologies. Thanks for that question. Other questions? Or questions for Michael about <laughs> my... <laughs> yeah, please. I was wondering about the, the fishing trawlers and the, and the trawlers we should have picked up there. Um, and what, what is there any study about which one's worse or, or are they both about the same? I know that the industrial trawlers are really doing a very bad job in the ocean floor and hurting the animals. Right. Thanks for that question. Just to briefly recapture it for those on Zoom, the question is about kind of the relative damages caused by different types of deep sea trawling or equipment. Um, so you are right that uh, types of fisheries that use trawling devices can be very harmful to the environment. Uh, you know, trying to catch shrimp, for instance, right? You're dragging a net across the seafloor. Those fisheries don't want the rocks, <laughs> right? So while they are, they can be very destructive in terms of breaking deep sea corals and other things that provide the habitat for those fisheries nurseries. Um, uh, those can reset because the substrate is still there. The coral larvae can still find somewhere to land and regrow. That's why, you know, uh, for instance, you can still have repeat fisheries in the same place because those environments can reset even though they get damaged. In contrast, what we want to, what is the thought for deep sea mining is that you are actually trying to physically remove that rock. So you would basically be dredging up the rocks and the mud, slurrying it on the bottom with some crushing devices and pumping it up to the surface to a support ship, dewatering it, and then putting the water back down into the ocean. And so you are really physically changing that environment by removing that hard substrate. There are some studies going on right now to try to see, well, what if we like reseeded the environment with different types of rocks like concrete or wood or something like that? Will the animals resettle? Um, but that those projects have just started. So we don't yet have a good sense of if that's a viable alternative. Other questions, thoughts? <laughs> yes. I ask a question with Michael. Yeah, yeah please. Um, would you be willing to just kind of share your inspiration for the hearing about that work and like what part of it you know about the focus is maybe on microbes or if we like delve into that at all or if it was generally the deep sea? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, when I first started working, Beth was introduced to me by Stephen as somebody who works um, in environments that I can't see. So I, I took that challenge on, or that we can't see, right? Because yeah. Beth, Beth deals with a lot of, um, you know, microscopic um, objects or 
animals, <laughs> not objects. Little beasties. <laughs> Little beasties. So um, I was, uh, in the beginning, I, I was really, I was just taking in all this information and visually sort of processing everything she showed me and everything I could find online and was really trying to understand what she did. And for a little while, like my head was just kind of full of a lot of hard science and me trying to understand it in my way, which was probably kind of worked. And then, um, and then it took me a while to sort of bring it down into my heart and think about it and feel it and um, get a sense of what all this means emotionally, physically, spiritually, all of it, you know, what it means to us as, you know, part of this environment. And, um, and then translating it without illustrating it, right? Because I'm an abstract painter and I'm not interested in taking pictures of things. I'm much more interested in sort of expressing the emotional aspects of these um, ideas and the subject matter and um, creating a space where um, it's possible for people to have their, have a journey of their own and think about this work and experience sort of the violence and the beauty of it all and just take it in and think about it. And also to have the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations where, um, where art and science are linked together and talking about ideas that we are still trying to understand and environments that we are still exploring and trying to understand. Um, and the more I get into it, the more excited I am by it. So this feels like just uh, the yeah, part time. Um, but you know, it just feels like the beginning of this, um, the, the creatures and um, species that live at the, on the ocean floor and in the deep sea are seem remarkable to me and amazing. And then there's something that, that I don't know a lot about, but that Beth has talked to me a little bit about, and that's the implications for understanding life in extreme places on other planets too. So there's, there's like this vast world um, that goes so far beyond anything I've ever experienced. Um, and I'm just like so excited by Beth's work and her stewardship of this, you know, these spaces and concerns and care for it all. So. I don't know if that answered your no, question. Um, really. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Other questions or reactions? Yeah, please. I would encourage you all to take a look at Michael's uh, website. This, this work is of a piece with the recent Supreme Court in the last decade. And it's, just, it's an extension of uh, further of this concept, first time to tackle these kind of things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very much so. And uh, Michael and I have talked um, in our conversations as the art has been developing and, and what might happen with it next. And also thinking about um, the other exhibits and other um, uh, themes of Michael's work. There was so much interesting synergy between my interests and the past work, even though I had never um, uh, been exposed to it before in terms of thinking about mining, thinking about how, uh, you know, humans interact with environments um, and the cultures of those interactions, etc. So I'm excited about what this isn't the end, right? <laughs> there's, there's more to happen with this collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one from the virtual audience. Oh, great. Yes. Can you actually be mute for a second? I can just read it. I will. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Kyle who said, uh, to expand on the previous question, could you both talk about how art can expand the science and how the science can be exposed to new thinking through art? How does this type of collaboration uh, mutually benefit uh, both of you? Uh, or not Michael, Kyle. Kyle. Yes. Um, Michael, do you wanna say something first and then I can respond? Uh, sure. Um, so my, my work in general, the, my practice involves, um, it, it all falls under the um, umbrella of studying environmental science. 
and then um, collaborating with different institutions, different cons conservation inst institutions um, throughout and developing projects around that. And the reason I do that is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons I do it, but one of the reasons is because um, these, idea, th these ideas are um, exciting to me and interesting and very relevant. And um, one of the ways that I personally understand a lot of ideas is by working through ideas with art. And um, the result of that is that it creates a space where other people can think about, talk about, um, you know, discuss um, these, these sort of ideas. And um, so in terms of like, why, why is it good? I mean, the other, the other aspect of it, I think is that, like Beth was saying, some of the stuff we don't even know, we don't even know what exists down there yet. Um, we don't know what exists on other planets. We don't know what it looks like. And so by, as, as an artist, this is very exciting to me because it's a place where we can kind of dive in and like use our imagination and explore different things and um, and sort of collaborate. So that's, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, for me, so part of my excitement for this collaboration is that, um, uh, again, I am one of a very rarefied group of people who gets the privilege to get to go to the deep ocean and know how amazing and wonderful it is. And I want to use every mechanism available to me to get other people excited about it so that we care about it and we think about how we want to conserve it and protect it. And uh, through art, art enables in a way that I as a scientist with my graphs can't capture your heart and your imagination. Um, and so I'm excited for the potential of these pieces and the memories that the people who experience these paintings have when they now know that there's a connection of the deep sea to the inspiration for these, to remember that and to think about it when they're at home, you know, and of all the things to worry about in the world, right? The deep ocean is probably way on the bottom of your list, but it is, um, uh, again, with art, it, rem it will remind you that it's important in a way that typical science communication can't uh, or struggles to. Um, and so that's what I get out of it and why I'm thankful for it. Um, I hope we answered your question, Kyle. <laughs> great. Are there other questions online, Stephen? That's it so far. Okay, great. Any more from the in-person audience? Great. Well, thank you again so much for coming and please take some time to look at the art and talk to us more, uh, talk to Michael more about it for sure. And if you wanna know more about the Dixie, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thanks. Thank you.